Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, we are continuing our sermon series on the book of Daniel. This is Daniel chapter 2, Kingdoms Come, Kingdoms Go. Now, last week, our elder women brought us through Daniel chapter 1, the opening chapter of the book of Daniel, to see how Daniel and his friends were sent into exile, into Babylon, uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar, who is basically a foreign king, a Gentile king, and now they have to live life as elect exiles in a foreign land. And certain things they can uh, accept and certain things they cannot assimilate into Babylonian uh, culture. So things that didn't um, compromise their faith, their loyalty to uh, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, they were okay with. These include uh, name change. This include being educated in Akkadian, in Babylonian culture and customs, even their mythologies um, and their ways, and even taking up government jobs. They were more than willing uh, to take up government jobs. They didn't think that that would be compromising their faith. But when it comes to matter of food, and in this particular situation that they were in, eating of the food would constitute a betrayal uh, to the Lord, and people would see them as having compromised their faith, and uh, they would not uh, assent to um, such impurity in their lives. So wisdom is required as to how to navigate these kind of things. And now we come to something even more dangerous today. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Let's begin with Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar was still just, just started to be king. Um, this is the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. So the first year he probably spent um, making sure that he knew all the officials who are, who are on his side, who is not on his side, stabilized the kingdom. Um, he had to do a lot of things to, um, uh, to win the support of people and officers. So, but this is the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. It's probably time to take some decisive actions, but this is basically early in his reign. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Basically, he had a nightmare. And the king awoke from his dream. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, basically the astrologers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. So the Chaldeans will be the locals, uh, the wise men, the court officials, who is uh, experts in, in interpretations, in uh, interpreting dreams, to be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and here from now on, all the way until the end of chapter 7, the language of the book of Daniel shifted from Hebrew to Aramaic. So we have been in Hebrew all along until right here, the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, suddenly we have a language shift in the book and uh, we will be in Aramaic all the way until the end of chapter 7 before coming back to Hebrew in chapter 8. Anyways, the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Basically, your majesty, uh, tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. Now, you'll be surprised as to why uh, were they thinking about interpreting the king's dream? Now, in ancient times, uh, anytime the king has something like this, a dream um, that is significant, that he felt was significant, <coughs> he, would, he, he would tell it to his astrologers, to his uh, wise men, so that you get an interpretation because it is important for him, it is important for the empire, so the gods would speak to kings. In, in dreams, and, and therefore, what the wise men of uh, Babylon and other ancient cultures, what they have done is that they kind of make a science out of it. So every time they, they see a certain particular motif in a particular dream, um, 
they will note it down and then they will have some interpretation and they see whether did it happen, did it not happen according to the interpretation and so they come up with common features so if I saw a tree, a tree would represent that if I saw a statue, a statue would represent this and this and that so they have kind of like have a, uh, have a science of interpretation if you will that is basically tested according to um, whether it did it happen, did it not happen, and then they will adjust accordingly. So what they will do is that, hey, you have a dream, okay, tell us your dream, and then we will go to our books, and then we're going to look it up, all the references, and then we're going to give you the interpretation that was uh, the idea back then. So the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limbs, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. So the king woke up the wrong side of the bed, isn't it? And what a bad day it was to be an astrologer in Babylon. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So this is some kind of a high risk, high reward gambit. If you succeed, you will be rewarded with riches beyond your dreams. And if you fail, then you and your houses will be in ruins. Okay, so that's the kind of situation that we're in. They answered the second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream. And we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. Now, if you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. You are just beating your time. You are just trying to divert the issue. I ask you, Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. Otherwise, I know you guys very well educated, very eloquent. I'm going to tell you something, and you can twist it around uh, to, to answer back with something rather vague about the harvest, or something rather vague about the army that could either or either not happen. You know how to protect yourselves. You're too clever for this. No, 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 no. If you are really good at your job, if you are really an enchanter, you are really an astrologer, you are really a magician, you will be able to know and tell me what is my dream. And if you are able to do that, then I will trust your interpretation. <laughs> it was indeed a bad, bad day for astrologers. They didn't see that coming. They looked at the stars and didn't see this coming. And the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. And that's true. Nobody has ever made such a request. It was an unreasonable request. So the question then is that why did the king make such a request? Was he crazy? Was this all random? Or does he have a reason? So scholars have thought about this and I've thought about this. So this was the second year of his reign, right? And in the first year, he probably needed to ingratiate himself with his officials. And now he's, he wants to take action, come into his own, isn't it? And basically he wanted to clean the house, I think. He wanted to get rid of the lot of them so that uh, he could put in his own people, um, because these were the leftovers, isn't it, from the previous administration, the previous king's officials, and uh, maybe they didn't like him, maybe they liked his brother better, or, or whatever it is. So he couldn't trust these people, and you can see that he, he did not trust these officials at all, and probably was looking for an excuse to execute them, so that he can start his administration with fresh uh, people, with people that is on his side. I think that's really what was going on. So, the answer is, 
The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods. We are just mere mortals. We cannot tell you this. Only the gods can do that. Whose dwelling is not with flesh. Interesting. Didn't have, they have temples. and don't, Didn't they say that the, the gods dwell in those temples? But here they say, no, no, this kind of thing. We, we, we have books. We have knowledge, we have wisdom, we have tradition, we have uh, a body of work that we can consult. But you are asking something miraculous. You, can, you are asking something that only the gods can do. And this is an important, important point uh, in this chapter. Only something divine or source, something of divine origin. But something of divine origin is not with us does not dwell with flesh. We have no access to it. Nobody can have access to that. Verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Those who were there, those who were not there, all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. It was a bad day to be a wise man in Babylon. Clearly, the king was looking for an excuse to get rid of all these officials so that he can install his own. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions. They were wise men too. They were court officials too. But they weren't even there to begin with. This was totally random. They sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. It was a bad day for Daniel and friends. What are you going to do? You are living in a Gentile world. You are living as an elect exile. Things just seem random things. Well, the king was arbitrary, isn't it? It's not your fault. And all of a sudden, your life is at stake. That is how it is with life living in a world that is not under God, living in a world that is under this arbitrary and all-powerful human kings, devoid of the fear of God. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Ariel, the captain of the king's guard, who has gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. So this is there's the need for wisdom in times of trouble. Uh, and here Daniel displayed wisdom in abundance. And we who live in a world that um, does not care for our values. And we need to know what is prudence and how to have discretion. He declared to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Interesting. He didn't say, the king's decree was wrong. The king's decree was right. No, 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 he didn't have any of that. He asked, why is the decree of the king so urgent? If he had said, I disagree with this decree, it is an unrighteous decree, then he would have died there and then, uh, wouldn't he? Um, and you say, yeah, we should kill the lot of us, then he would have died there as well. So this is a very, very prudent, wise response. Why is the decree of the king so urgent? And he says this with, with, you can sense the calm in his voice, isn't it? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. All right, so he says, give me more time. Now, why did... um? Nebuchadnezzar allowed Daniel. What did he say? He must have said things with wisdom, isn't it? And that's important. And now the stakes are very high. You have put everything on your shoulder now. Everything now depends on whether you know the dream, whether you're able to provide the interpretation. Otherwise, you will die, and a whole lot of you will die. You, your friends, and the other wise men of Babylon. Okay, what would you do in this situation? Only the gods can tell you 
can tell the king what his dream was. How can you know what someone else's dream would be? If you're in this situation, what would you do? You would do what Daniel does here, isn't it? Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to his friends, to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. What you would do is that go and tell your Christian friends, your close spiritual companions, and say, hey, brothers and sisters, get down on your face and pray. <laughs> That's the only thing left to do. Because Daniel wouldn't have known what the king's dream was. So get down on your face and pray desperately to the God of heaven, that the God of heaven may be merciful to us to uh, show us this mystery. There's a lot of trust in God and zero reliance on the self. But there's no way you can rely on yourself on this matter, can you? Is that? So that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Wisdom, wisdom in dealing with the situation and wisdom in turning to God, in relying on God. That is the only thing you can do as you live in a world that is not under uh, God directly, but rather under this arbitrary human rulers. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in the vision of the night. Now, there's no guarantee that such a thing would happen. Had such a thing not happened, then uh, Daniel and his friends would be um, killed together with the rest of the wise men of Babylon, and that's okay. And that's a different story. And that is still God's sovereignty, and blessed be the name of the Lord. But in this particular instance, the mystery was revealed to Daniel because uh, God wanted to reveal to Daniel because God has something he wants to accomplish. So that Daniel, having uh, understood the mystery, blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belong what? Wisdom and might. Two things. Let's talk about might. He changes times and seasons. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. You see, seasons, the four seasons, from uh, summer to autumn to winter to springtime, it's this, it is God who is sovereign over times and seasons. And just as he is Sovereign over matters of heaven, times and seasons, he is also sovereign over matters on earth. He removes kings and sets up kings. He say that now is the end of summer, now is the beginning of autumn, now is the end of autumn, now is the beginning of winter. And as God is capable and God is the one who decides that, so God is also the one who removes kings, sets up kings. God is in control. But not just might. Wisdom as well. To whom belong wisdom and might. On the matter of wisdom, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might. And you have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. What a wonderful, wonderful prayer. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. So God reveals wisdom. God is sovereign. Let's get on with the story. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch. He has now an audience with the king whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. <clears throat> he went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. He, he really cares for not just for himself and his friends, but also for these wise men of Babylon as well. Uh, Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. So basically, Daniel surrendered himself to Arioch. Daniel was the one who took initiative 
to come to Ariok. But notice what Ariok says in verse 25, that Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found <laughs> among the exiles from Judah a man who, what do you mean, you have found? Bound. No, no, no. Daniel was the one who came to you. Okay, well, that's politics, isn't it? Ariok wanted to get some brownie points as well, wanted to have some credit for uh, finding the solution. So, okay, and, and Daniel allows him, right? There's no need to fight over this matter. Daniel shouldn't. Daniel, he's, he's a wise man. He has discretion. He's prudent. He wouldn't say, no, Ariok, in front of the king. No, Ariok. It wasn't you, it was me. No, 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 no. Okay, let's get on with the important things. I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. What? Exiles from Judah? These are defeated people. How useful can they be? Babylon has won. Israel, Judah has lost. Definitely, it means that the Babylonians are superior. And the Babylonians, wise men, astrologers, magicians, enchanters, all of them failed the task. Who is this exile from Judah? What would he know? He's, a, he's, he's from, a, um, um, from a lesser stock. He, he is lesser than us. His God is lesser than than our God. His God is inferior to ours. That would be what Nebuchadnezzar would think. What does an exile from Judah has to offer? The king declared to Daniel, whose name was, was Belteshazzar. This was, his, um, this was his Babylonian name to show that he was a, also an um, upright citizen of Babylon at this point. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? I mean, it's a rather surprise thing, isn't it? I mean, the king's idea is that surely nobody can do this. It's time to get rid of a lot of them. But this is interesting. You're able to make known to me my dream that I've seen and its interpretation. So tell me, what's the interpretation? So Daniel gives his opening statement. Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. Isn't that true? Yeah, that's true. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he had made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You see, Daniel was in no hurry. He already knew what's the word of God. He already knows the mystery. He was in no hurry to tell the king so that he would stay alive and get it done and over with. <laughs> we just dodge a bullet. No, no, he takes his time and makes sure Nebuchadnezzar understand where does this come from? No wise man can do it. No enchanter, no magician, no astrologer, no PhD professors, experts, epidemiologists, immunologists, no, nobody. Nobody. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You need to know where does this come from, King Nebuchadnezzar? All right, are you ready? Are you ready for it? Your dreams and your visions of your heads as you lay in the bed are these. It's a dream. It's a dream. No, let me detour. Let me make sure you... Get it. I'm going to tell you a second time. Yes, he's quite brave, Daniel, isn't it? This is his extended opening statement. Come on, get on with the dream already. No, no, no. I'm about to tell you a dream. Be patient. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he, I need you to know that, where does this come from again? He who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living. It's not really because I'm smarter than all these other astrologers and enchanters and magicians and wise men of Babylon. I'm just an exile from Judah. I'm nobody. But in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you 
may know the thoughts of your mind. I want you to know that what the astrologer says were only something that the gods would know, but the gods do not dwell with flesh. The God of heaven has made known to me. What a wonderful opening statement. He hasn't even told the king what the dream is yet. He's just prefacing and prefacing, making sure that the king understands the source of the dream. So here's the point. The point is not the dream. The point is the source of the dream. Who is the revealer of wisdom? You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image mighty and exceeding and of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening the head of this image was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver its middle and thigh of bronze its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay as you look a stone was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. So they didn't just get broken in pieces that kind of disintegrated into powder, isn't it? And the wind carried them away. They just disappeared. So that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, had the king told uh, the astrologers what his dream was, they would have been able to interpret it because uh, this about an image and then um, with the head of gold and the arm of something else and the bronze of... This is a typical dream of a king. Uh, we have these in other writings, ancient writings in archaeology, we found that, yeah, kings did have, the, have these dreams and um, there were interpretation for it. But the problem is they didn't know the dream. And the, another thing is that in those dreams that we can read about in archaeology, there is not this stone cut out by no human hand, which means it's of divine origin, isn't it? No human hand. And that stone strikes the image at its feet and breaks the whole thing from bottom to top, the whole thing to pieces. And then that stone becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. And that's how it looks like. Head of gold upper body with in silver and then lower body with bronze and then after that iron and clay feet and then the stone comes and destroy the whole thing shattering it into pieces turning them into powder and blew away by the wind and then that stone grows into a large mountain and that's the end of the story what does it mean this was the dream now we will tell the king its interpretation. There are going to be three kingdoms. You, O king, the king of kings, you are a great king, king above all kings, but you are not the greatest. Your power is derivative. To whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. The kingdom, power, might, and glory be unto you. Nebuchadnezzar, but it is not yours by your own ability, but rather it has been given to you by the God of heaven. And into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. And this is just reminds you of Genesis chapter 1, isn't it? God created human beings in his own image to be king, to rule over everything else. And Nebuchadnezzar is now the king of kings. See, it's like this image of God, so to speak, isn't it? You are the head of gold. 
Okay. Another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Which doesn't sound important at all, given the context of this whole thing. Yeah, rule over all the earth. It's, it's actually quite impressive. It's just that Daniel had no patience telling us what it is, describing in detail. He's just um, more interested in the next one. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. So you crush all these other kingdoms. But the thing is that its, uh, it's feet and toes is partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. So it shall be a divided kingdom. Uh, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw, iron mixed with soft clay. So uh, it's strong, strong as iron, but it's partly clay, as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. So there's weaknesses with this very, very powerful fourth kingdom. As you saw, the Iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, what are these kingdoms? So we have the first kingdom, uh, there's gold, and very um, thankfully, that Daniel told us what it is, that is Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we can say Babylon, but actually you, Nebuchadnezzar, is the gold, head of gold. But anyway, let's say Babylon. and then. Second kingdom of silver, inferior. The third one is a worldwide, uh, but characterized by bronze. And then we have a dominant but divided iron clay kingdom. And then we have the kingdom of God, uh, the rock, the mountain, that's eternal kingdom. Now, some interpreters, traditional interpreters, will say, well, the first one is Babylon, then the second one is Middle Persia, and then the one is the third one is Greece, and then the fourth one is Rome, and then Jesus Christ came bringing the kingdom of God, now started, uh, but will consummate at the end of time. And as Rome continues to, uh, the, the influence of Rome continues to attenuate into the present times, or maybe one day there is going to be a reunification of the Roman Empire or something like that, and then the kingdom of God. So that's one interpretation. Another interpretation will be, uh, okay, Babylon, you are the head of gold. And then the second kingdom, an inferior one, Media. And then a larger kingdom, uh, Persia. And then one that is dominant, uh, Greece, Alexander the Great, conquered everything, but then divided among his generals. And then the kingdom of God will come. So these are some, uh, two of the three options that I know. The third one is a bit more confusing, but there are some options. Who knows which is which, but whichever it is, the point is clear, isn't it? There are all these worldly kingdoms, all these earthly kingdoms, one stronger than the other, kingdoms come, kingdoms go, but at the end, the kingdom of God will arrive. When the rock comes, they smash all these kingdoms into smithereens, and then becomes a mountain, and that is the eternal kingdom of God. And here, Daniel describes to us the kingdom of God. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, his own kingdom, that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that means it's of divine origin, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And here's the finishing touch. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. Remember what this whole thing is about. This whole thing is about the sovereignty, the wisdom, the might of God. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation, sure, mic drop. I don't want to hear any debates about it. Nobody else can tell you the dream, much less its interpretation. I don't want you to dispute, ah, could it have mean this, could it have mean man? No, 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 no. This is it. No food, no thing required. God revealed this to me. The God of heaven has made known to you. The dream is certain. Its interpretation, sure. I rest my case.
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel. He was the king of kings, isn't it? But then now he says, commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God, I am the king of kings, but your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. The gods have come to dwell with flesh. He has come to dwell with you, Daniel. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts, made him a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. So now he becomes the uh, person in charge of all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made the request of the king and get his friends promoted, appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Ultimately, who is Nebuchadnezzar? Frightening man, Nebuchadnezzar the Great, powerful, strong-willed. His word is the law, and many people could have died on that day. Absolute power. But who was he? No, no. There is a God of gods and the Lord of kings, the revealer of wisdom. And this whole thing, kingdoms come, kingdoms go, they will all come to an end. Now you say, well, is it Babylon? Yes. And then Middle Persia, one of the two, or two together. And then you say, oh, it's Greece, or maybe it's Rome. Well, in a sense, it's all of them, isn't it? It's Greece, it is Rome, it is what comes after that. It's the Chinese empires in the East. It is Genghis Khan. It is the French, the British, the Americans, the Japanese, the Germans. It's everybody. Everybody, human kings, without the fear of God. And one day, all their arbitrariness will come to an end. Because the Son of God, Psalm 2, He will inherit the nations. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces, all these worldly kingdoms, like a potter's vessel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So the rock is the son of God. It's very interesting that in Hebrew, son is ben. Rock is even. So they kind of sound similar, just one alphabet extra. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And you have this uncut rock, rock that's not cut by any human hands, and will smash all these nations, and you will inherit all the nations. And that will happen one day. Our Lord has come. The Son of God has come the first time to make purification for sins. But he's going to come back a second time. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, our Lord and of his Christ, he shall reign forever and ever. All these human kingdoms will make way for the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of God is already here today. Wherever the influence of God's people reach his representatives on earth, that is the kingdom of God, pointers to the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God will one day be made manifest for all to see. It is now already here, but not yet in full. As the book of Revelation comes to an end, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues, that means when it all comes to an end, when all the judgment are meted out. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away 
in the spirit to a great high mountain, right? The rock smashes the kingdoms and becomes a great mountain. Yes, this great high mountain is the holy city, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from God. So not only is Christ the rock that smashes, that comes down from heaven, and becomes the great high mountain. His people, the bride, the wife of the Lamb, the new Jerusalem, Christ and his bride has become one. And we are included in this story. Having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most gradual, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So what is that to do right now? The Son has won the victory on the cross. And today he's on a mission by sending us into all the world to regain the nations for him. Jesus came and said to them after he rose from the dead, all authority in heaven and on earth, not just in heaven, but also on earth, all the authorities of the kingdoms of the world is right here with me, has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Recover all those nations for me. This is the way that his kingdom will come. This is the way where Christ will gain the nations. That is by sending us out, by us going out to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching people to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, the Lord will be with us always to the end of the age. Yes, Jesus has won the victory in, on the cross. And Jesus is now has all the authority in heaven and on earth. But he, it pleases him to involve us. He says, this is how it's going to get done. Go. Go to all these nations and bring them back to me. And that, brothers and sisters, is our part. That is why we have been sent to live as elect exiles in a seeming arbitrary world uh, run by arbitrary rulers. Maybe you would say, ah, isn't it better if I should just die right now and go to heaven or whatever? Why does the Lord leave me here? The Lord leave you here as an elect exile because the Lord has sent you into the world to recover the nations for him. So then we pray. We close with this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May the Lord's kingdom come. May the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even as we pray this prayer, even as we wait with expectation the coming of the Lord, let us go and make disciples of all the nations, bringing them under subjection to the Son of God, to the rock who will smash all the kingdoms of the world and reconcentrate power in his own hands and becomes this great mountain, a new heaven and a new earth, new Jerusalem. The Lord has revealed this wisdom to us. He is the revealer of wisdom. Let us make wise decisions today for the kingdom of God. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. In one election cycle, we may just about to have three different governments Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. But the kingdom of God will be established forever. God bless you.